You know, when you're having fun, the time flies by. <laughs> so maybe I can pick that up for that. But it has been very good, and I've enjoyed the... I've enjoyed you all because you were willing to take on this poor speaker up here and, and challenge, because that really makes it a lot more fun for me. So I hope you'll do the same thing uh, this, this morning. Uh, let us begin with prayer. Dear God, we're grateful for your many, many gifts, especially your gift of love and care for all of us and for all your people. Please let your spirit be with us in this hour that we might discern what might be true for us in our faith journey and to better know you. In your son's name we pray. Amen. This has been a tough week for me. I had one of my idolatries exploded. My computer died. My computer. <laughs> I had so much faith in that machine and it totally let me down. But I'm getting a new computer this afternoon, if you can believe that. So that's one of the reasons there are no handouts this week, because I like to give them handouts. But y'all are smart people, you can follow along. Today I do get to be a Christian, which is a big help. Uh, although it's interesting to play those other parts, I want to talk more from the Christian perspective about other religions. And to see uh, really three things. So it's very simple what I want to do today. I want us to examine from the Christian uh, perspective whether or not there is um, salvation in other religions. So we'll look at that first. Secondly, we'll look at uh, is there revelation in other religions? Now, revelation is, of course, different from salvation. Revelation is some word from God to different religions. Um, we want to look at that a little bit. And then third and finally, I want to look at what is unique about Christianity. We've talked about all these other religions and what their beliefs are, but what, is the, what are the beliefs or what is the belief in Christianity that makes us different from all the other mainline world religions that we've been looking at? Okay, you got that? Salvation. Revelation. What is special about Christianity? Salvation. What does the word salvation mean to you? You all have any out? Well, you talk about it. So, I mean, uh, there's some songs about it too, aren't there? <laughs> <laughs> there are. What does salvation actually mean? Have you all ever been burned in a fire and put some ointment on it? <coughs> What's that called? Uh, oh, what do you know? The same word. Have you ever thought about that? Seven, salvation actually come from the same word. And in fact, salvation means healing. And so, in the perspective of all religions, including Christianity, this is the idea of how can you be healed in the Christian faith so that you can experience eternal life. Now, I need to make a very, I, I'm sorry, I'm going to have to give you some words that maybe you haven't been aware of. Well, I know you've been aware of the words. You know the words, but maybe a, a different way of looking at it. Eternal life, as it's expressed in the New Testament, begins now. It is not some future thing that you will have uh, in the afterlife. It is the healing that you experience from your faith in this life that makes your life kind of a preview of what the afterlife is going to be. And so eternal life is in the present. And Christianity, like the, all the other major world religions, looks at ways in which your life can be changed now. Now, I know that's not a belief or an understanding that everybody might have. Oh, by the way, since I'm a Christian, I can be really opinionated today. Isn't that wonderful? I can't be opinionated so much when I'm a Buddhist or a Hindu because I don't want to tread on their religion. I don't, maybe I don't know enough about it. But I'm not sure I know all that much about Christianity after all these years. But I do have some understanding, so I want you to disagree with me if you think I'm wrong. Why well, I am happy to understand eternal life as in the present life, I know that there is a good reason not to think about it as simply the future life after I'm dead. 
Because if all I can do is say, one day it's going to get better. One day when I cross the River Jordan, suddenly I will discover new happiness and new freedom. Then Karl Marx is really right, isn't he? When he said, religion is just an opiate. It's just a way to get you through all the problems of the present life with some future hope. Have you ever thought about the people that talk the most about heaven? Crossing the River Jordan? Well, they're really having a tough time now, I would say. <laughs> yes, thank you. They, they're the very people that are the most oppressed now. And I can understand the people that are most oppressed longing for something better. I'm sorry that they don't understand that perhaps that better can be in this life, but I don't, I certainly understand why they would think that. But it seems to me as, as, as Christians in the United States, we have an obligation almost to, to push the idea of eternal life and what it means for us. Any questions? In, in the time of, of slavery, the slaves had nothing to, as you are speaking of, at eternal life on earth. That's right. There was nothing. There is no hope so for it. Many of their That's right. songs were of what was to come. Yeah. You know the great, uh, the great song, uh, everybody talking about heaven ain't a going there. <laughs> That's no uh, African American slavery spiritual. I've got shoes, you've got shoes, all God's children got shoes. Why do they sing that? They didn't have any shoes. And when I get to heaven, I'm going to put on my shoes, and what am I going to do? Walk. Why did they look forward to that? They couldn't walk away from the plantation. And so walking was a statement of liberation to them. So we see how oppressed people, if they have no hope. But it seems to me that we have hope and ways to transform our lives and make it different. And so that's basically what salvation means for me. That I have got to ask my question, ask myself, what is there in Christianity that transforms my life now, right now, makes me different and gives me some understanding of what heaven is going to be? Now, can we judge other religions? Can we say that Hindus and Muslims and Buddhists are going to hell? We didn't think we were supposed to judge. Thank you. Good. <laughs> Who told you that? Did they tell you that? <laughs> and then I'll say it again because I ought to make sure that comes home. The Bible is just loaded with passages where it warns you about judging. Now let me be clear about this. I can, as I said earlier, I can judge another person's actions. If you rob a bank, I can say, why did you do that? That was a bad thing to do. That's, that's judging a person's action. But what I can never do, it seems to me from Scripture, is to say, you robbed a bank, you're going to hell. And there's a big difference in there. There really is a difference between those, those two things. And where do I get that idea? Where is it? In, in Scripture. Judge not, but you be not judged. That's right. That's straight out of Jesus Christ's mouth in the Sermon on the Mount. You know, that's a good passage to think about. Remember what he says? Don't go to your friend and say, let me take the speck out of your eye when I've got a log in my own. And so the idea of judging people is not, not just Jesus, but at the very beginning of the story of Genesis. Y'all know the story about Adam and Eve and how uh, Eve was uh, in the garden and the serpent came up to her and said, uh, why, why don't you eat the trees, uh, the tree of, of the garden that is the tree of good and evil? I'm abbreviating it. It's a little bit more complicated than that. But that's basically the bottom line. Okay, we, where was Adam all during this time? I don't get the women off the hook real quick. <laughs> Can you get Eve for me? Mr. Sacker, come on. Come on, I want you to be my Eve. Come on, Eve. <laughs> and so, 
Charles Blakely that's going to be the serpent. Okay? And he's, ta yeah, he's talking to you. Here's where Adam is. I wonder what she's going to do. <laughs> You did a good job, thank you. I just want to make the point that 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 Adam was, you know, the real the ancient picture showing him standing right behind Eve as she's trying to make this. He doesn't say don't do that at all. He just kind of watches from the distance. When the serpent asks uh, Eve, what will happen if she eats of the tree? She says, God has told us that we can eat uh, if we eat of it or even touch it. She says, God never said that. Uh, if we eat it or even touch it, we will die. And the serpent says, not so. No. God knows that when you eat of it, you will become like God. You might know the next part. Knowing the difference between good and evil. And so this position of judging another person is a power that God has. You will be like God. It's not a human right. It's something we have tried to seize all the way back from the original sin. Thank you for the example from uh, Jesus. Let me give you one more. You know when the rich man comes to Jesus and says, uh, good teacher, what must I do to be saved? And do you know what Jesus responds? That's right. Yeah, love the Lord your God. And he says, give away all you have. But you know what he says before that? He turns to this man and said, why do you call me good? Only God is good. We kind of, we kind of get over that passage. When you look it up. It's really amazing that Jesus is sensitive to this labeling of people on the basis of whether they're good or bad. Yes. Okay. But as a, as a parent, or even not as a parent, it, you don't judge people, but how do you teach your children right and wrong if everything's okay? Oh, I didn't say everything. I understand that. We're in a culture, <laughs> we're in a culture now where, they're, where everything is acceptable. We don't want to hurt anybody's feelings, or we don't want to... I mean, oh, right, I'm not, no. The right wrong thing is getting pretty great. No, I think that the issue remains what their actions are. I, I have said, and I hope you never do this. I made a student cry once over this. This is not good. But I'll tell it to you. Um, I think you can say to your child, you ran out in the street. That's a bad thing to do. And now you want to be punished for going out into the street. I am disappointed that you ran out into the street. What would be wrong is to say, I'm disappointed in you. I think that's a big difference. And I hope parents, it was, I haven't been one, so I don't know what parents do this first moment. And I have, I'm honestly, but I think be careful about judging your child rather than your child's actions. And basically, that's what I'm saying is the standard that I think Christianity holds. Yeah? Doesn't that go back to individual responsibility? Sure. And it's laid on all individuals. That's right. And God is the higher platform. And that's his responsibility. So it lets me off the hook as far as judging. That's right. Very well said. Want to do a lecture for me? <laughs> <laughs> Coming up, I, lo I love your help. So I hope we don't get ourselves into a, uh, a mess here. I do not think we have any business condemning any other religious group and saying that because they don't believe that Jesus Christ is Lord, that means they're going to hell. We just can't say that. That's God's business, not ours. So I guess I'm off the hook about the judging part in that way. But I still wonder about the other issue, which is the business about what revelation means. What revelation means. And here's the question I want to pose to you this morning. Is it possible that I can take the good ideas from all the religions we've talked about, Hinduism, Buddhism, Judaism, and Islam, and in effect take the ideas from those religions that help strengthen my Christian faith and use them to that advantage? 
This is sometimes called baptizing other beliefs. How do I judge what I can baptize and what I shouldn't baptize? How do I make the decision? Well, I look for in Jesus Christ examples of where he taught and said things that are basically reflected in the teachings of other religions. Now you'd say, well, why don't you stick to Christianity? Because every religion we've talked about over the last four weeks have had ways in which I might be able to get closer to the teachings of Jesus. Have you ever thought about that? Let me give you just one example. Islam has the five pillars of their beliefs, five actions that they do. One of those actions involves prayer. And how often is a Muslim supposed to pray? Five times a day. Upon awakening in the morning, at noon, at mid-afternoon, at sunset, and when they go to sleep. Now, the Quran says they don't have to always do that if they're in a place where it's impossible to do or if they're in danger of their own lives by doing it, they don't have to do it. So it's not like some rigid rule that Islam has set down. Suppose as a Christian I decide I'm going to follow those five periods of prayer. You know, I'm not so sure that would hurt me very much. Certainly, God wants me to pray. And unfortunately, in American life today, there's precious little time for prayer for most people. We pray if we get in a scrape. We pray if, uh, if it's bedtime, maybe. I just don't know anymore. It doesn't seem to be we're together as families enough to pray over a meal. And it would be nice to have a standard by which you could say, you know, let me try this for a month. Pray five times a day. I think that would be very helpful to me and strengthen my Christianity, even though it's a belief of another religion. Does that work? It says, though, in the Bible, it doesn't pray without ceasing. Yes. Do that. <laughs> and you say no, and you're exactly right. But you see, when it says pray without ceasing, what ends up happening is we say, oh, I can't do that. You know, maybe I'll pray once a day. I think, and there's a great story behind uh, the prayer. You know, the story was that uh, Muhammad went up to God, and, um, and God said, I want you to pray 50 times a day. And he comes back down out of heaven to go back to earth. He runs into Moses. And Moses said, 50 times a day, are you kidding? <laughs> you can't possibly keep that. Go back up there and negotiate a little bit. <laughs> so Muhammad goes back up and makes a trip four times. And God lowers it to 40 and 30 and 20 and 10 and finally five. And he's coming back down with this five, five times to pray. And Moses said, how many times now? And and Muhammad says five, and Moses said, you still can't do it. Go back up. And Muhammad said, no, I think I've gone enough. <laughs> it's kind of a nice story, but it shows you that sometimes we can reawaken the practices of our faith by using the examples of other religions. Let me give you another example. Mindfulness. Mindfulness is a teaching of Buddhism. It's part of the way they meditate. Christians have already baptized this sort of thing into the Christian faith. Have you ever heard of praying the Psalms or reading a passage and then everybody meditates upon what that means silently? That's basically the concept of mindfulness. And if that is helpful for my Christianity, I can acknowledge that Buddhism has given me help. Is that so terrible? What do we say about God's Holy Spirit? Is it confined to the walls of these buildings? It is not. It is possible that, possible, I think very probable, that God's Holy Spirit is anywhere people have an understanding of God that is a loving, caring, merciful, 
judging God, judging in love, because I think there is judgment, but gives us the idea that other religions can have possibilities of understanding uh, the Christian faith, and we can use those ways to help us in our own faith. What about the piece of scripture that says, no one cometh unto the Father except by me? Good, 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 good question, Harold. You know what's interesting about that passage to me? It doesn't say that I have to go to Jesus, does it? Maybe Jesus prepares the way for all religions. I will, I totally subscribe to the fact that the only way that I'm saved, or you're saved, or a Buddhist, possibly, I don't know, the only way we are saved, and I'll say the human race, is through Christ. Whether I acknowledge that or not, whether I acknowledge that or not, the only way I'm going to be saved is through Jesus Christ. Oh, somebody must have disagreed with that. I want to talk about that a little bit more. Well, I have a, have a comment um, related to that. You know, we, over the years, we've sent out missionaries to China and Africa and, and the Middle East who go with the firm conviction that unless these people hear the gospel and, and commit their lives to Christ, they are... Yeah, they are not saved. They not are lost. Right. Um, yeah. you know, without that firm conviction, we would not have supported those missionaries over the years. I mean, what, what does that say about our modern mission, oh, yeah. mission I mean, efforts? No, and, and let me say, I am not a relative. I am a Christian for a reason. Honestly, I, I mean, and I'm going to go off in a little bit, and I'm getting all out of order by your questions, so I don't know <laughs> where we're going to end up with this. Um, <coughs> Let me get my head on straight here. That was a good. At first, that was a very good question. Now, which which is the? I, you know, I, I I'm a church historian. That's my training, and I know that uh, the student of missions in the early 20th century said, you know, thousands of people die every day in China because they haven't heard the gospel. I mean, that was a great uh, impetus for people to go um, to go abroad. And I'm not saying, and I hope none of you all leave here saying, I think there's no difference between any of the religions. I mean, evangelism is very important to me. And it's important because I think Christianity has some unique understandings of how we get eternal life. That, are, that it is not in other religions. It, you can't find it. But we need to be clear on what that is. And we cannot be in the position of judging other people simply because they haven't heard the gospel. That would be cruelty, it seems to me. And the Roman Catholic Church, bless their hearts, have, have tried their best to make room by saying there are such things as anonymous Christians, people that never hear the gospel who desire baptism. It's called baptism by desire. I don't agree with that because there's some problems with it, and I'm a Protestant, and there are reasons I don't like what it says, but I, it shows an ability to reach out in all the great missions of the Roman Catholic Church, which has been probably the most ex successive of all the mission um, attempts, at least throughout history, until about the 1820s and 30s, when Protestants finally caught on that maybe they should go outside of Europe. So I think in a way, it's a, it is a sense that... Um, there's got to be a better reason than fear to bring people to the Christian faith. Perfect fear casts out. That, that, no, perfect love casts out fear. Not perfect fear. I'm sorry. Yes, sir. Doesn't the belief that we're basically saved by grace go right along with it? I, you bet. Because if you truly believe that you're saved by grace with no action or no belief on our part, Exactly. It's you, see, to that point. you sound like, you know, one a great Presbyterian. <laughs> <Good Lord. laughs> now, you're making me go to my last point, 15 minutes or I'm going to do it, because I'll come back and, and bore you all for 10 minutes about other things I was going to say. Um, 
Let me suggest this. In studying all the world religions, what I have discovered myself, and I maybe you would too, except for Judaism, and Judaism's a little waffly on it. Not all Christians are clear on this either, by the way. Um, all the other world religions say you can reach salvation or eternal life through your own efforts, but you've got to make the effort. That is absolutely crucial. Remember how we talked about in the Hindus, you ride up the escalator until you reach humans, human level, and then you've got to work for the rest of the way. It's called karma. And both Buddhism and Hinduism say the only way you will ultimately be saved is if you do these things, if you walk through the process. Now, there's one small branch of Buddhism that I've been able to find that is less like this, but it's still got requirements about your own salvation. And I think that's a marked difference. Judaism has come the closest to being free, but it's interesting. You know what's tied up with this belief? I'm going to use Islam as the example. Islam does not, you know, I've said what they, what they're different. They see Jesus Christ as a prophet made by God. They have very distinct understandings of Jesus that no other religion but Christianity has. So that's, that's something. But they have no doctrine of original sin. Now, the minute you throw out original sin, almost automatically you get work, work, work for your salvation. Any of y'all listen to Cook and Clack? Yes. The Tappan Brothers, they're good, aren't they? They had a miserable pun on their show. <laughs> <clears throat> Amazing Grease. How sweet the sound that saved a wrench like me. <laughs> and of course, that pun would not work if we didn't know Amazing Grace. But the one thing that Amazing Grace teaches is that I did not save myself. It is only through the grace of God that I am saved. And get this. The decision to be a Christian was not made by me but by the power of the Holy Spirit working through me. Well, you know what the answer to this one is? Tell me about your kids. If you're not going to punish them, or you're not going to hold them to doing things, on what basis do you expect them to ever turn out okay? Good question. You, you raised it. See, it's a good question. I, Walter Lingle, who I'm afraid nobody remembers anymore. He was a great... Oh, I've got two people here. Walter Lingle was a hero of mine. He was a Presbyterian minister in the first half of the 20th century. A good southern, southern boy from Wilson, I think, Ro Ro Roberson, North Carolina. And he went to my alma mater uh, named, uh, of course, Davidson. I bet there's not a Davidson person in. Walter <laughs> 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 uh, Walter Lingle tells the story about when he was getting ready to go to Davidson. Of course, they were the train back then. He uh, prepared his suitcases and everything. It was about a week before he was to go, and he knew he was going to let, get a lecture from his dad about what he should and shouldn't do when he goes off to college. And his father didn't talk to him. It was the day before, the day before he was to go, and still no luxury. He said, oh my goodness, maybe he's forgotten. <laughs> he said they were at the train station and the train was pulling in. And his father turned to him and said, uh, Walter, I have something I need to tell you. And Walter said, I thought, oh my goodness, here it comes. Thank goodness it doesn't get he doesn't have long to tell me everything I should or shouldn't do. And his daddy said, Walter, never forget how much your mother and I love you. That's all he said. And Walter made the wonderful point, how could I do anything that would disappoint them after that? 
And I think that's a key tenet of the Christian religion. Why do you do acts of goodness and kindness? Do you do it so God will put a star in your crown or put a star by your name in the book? I don't think so. No. You are saved. What are you going to do with it? You are saved. What are you going to do with your salvation? And if you go off and live a life of riotous sin and debauchery, I have no idea whether God will save you or not. That's none of my business, remember? But what I do know is that you have shown gross ingratitude to what God has done for you. And you know what the word ingratitude is in Arabic? It's the word infidel. Because the one sin that Islam has is the sin of forgetfulness. Forgetfulness, forgetting all that God has done for you, forgetting all that Christ did for you, means that you don't know what gratitude is. It's only through remembering. I love that word. Re, R-E, member. Join together. Become part of a group that understands that salvation is a free gift from God. And the only thing you have to do is be grateful. And your gratitude shows itself in all kinds of wonderful ways out there in the world. The question for us is not, are we saved? The question for us is, are we grateful enough? for that salvation. Or as another good Presbyterian once said, we do good things not so that we will be saved. No, because we are saved, we do good things. Now, as I said, religions of faiths that do not have original sin leave it all up to the individual. Islam is an example of that. You are supposed to work your way into righteousness. And I know there are Christians who think that. I was driving up here. I think I was in Ware Place. Ware Place this morning. Y'all heard of that. And there I saw a, a, a sign for the uh, Shady Grove Mosque. Oh, no. Shady Grove a Baptist Church. <laughs> that will say something that might offend somebody at this point. So if you don't hear something that might be offensive, please close your ears. I think, Muslim, um, uh, I think Islam has many great ideas. But the one that dropped this point drives me crazy. And I suddenly realized two years ago, why? Muslims remind me of Southern Baptists. <laughs> <laughs> now, let me tell you why I say that. Because I found by the sign for Shady Grove Baptist Church near where shows us up, they had a little sign up. And it said, get right or get left. I said, that's Islam. That's not Christianity. They don't know that. But they have this idea that salvation is still something of a human work. And one of the great reasons our denomination does infant baptism is because we don't think that. Okay, I see if there are any questions. Y'all got any questions about all that coming across? I'd like to bring you back to my question because I don't think you answered it. Okay, <laughs> you're a good man, Harold. Uh, if 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 there is no reason to study and, and know the the scriptures and, and Christ. Why did Christ come here for us? To save us. Yes. Right. How about the Hindu who doesn't believe that Christ... Maybe I, he could save you. Right? I don't know. I have no idea. It's none of my business. And what I'm saying is, I think God's love and mercy is broad enough that the whole universe can be saved. I have not ruled that out, by the way. But I think Christianity is unique. And I want to stress this one more time in that we stress gratitude, gratitude over working our way to heaven. I hope that works for you. And let me tell you, I, 
it's helpful for me sometimes to say, why am I, uh, why am I worried so much about these minor things? Why am I worried about my computer breaking? You know, really, honest. Aren't there bigger concerns in the world than little Peter Hobby's computer breaking? That's a Hindu approach, by the way. Looking down on myself and saying, poor Peter, his computer's broken. Um, but it's a good way to put some sort of, of handle on where my loyalty lies. My gratitude, if you will. And I have to be honest, Harold, even though I read the scriptures, and even though that I believe that Jesus Christ is Lord, I can never convince myself that that makes me worthy of salvation. I just don't have that. I don't have that confidence. I'm a selfish bastard, if you want to know the truth. I'm concerned about, I mean, right today, I was right over here, and my palms were a little damp, and I said, who are you trying to impress? <laughs> Do I come up here and stand up here so that y'all will clap and applaud me and tell me what a fine job I did? And so I can go home and think, ah, they love me up there. I mean, that's awful. But I have that terrible temptation still in my heart because my ego wants to be fed. And my, one of the great things about studying these world religions is they all say, that's the problem, it's your ego. And I think Jesus says that. The last shall be first. Servant, servanthood. All of that is about letting go of number one, which is always yourself. And to the extent that you can, nobody's going to get complete freedom. But to the extent to which you can smell what it's like, not to be so ego driven. You know what that smell is? It's the smell of the kingdom of God. It's eternal life. Now, and so if I take this belief, this salva salvation belief, out into Anderson and start practicing it, where I'm not worried about what other people might think about me, not that I would ever know, or how I look, am I thin enough? Did I shave well enough? <laughs> I mean, oh, these are so trivial, and yet they've got our lives over and over again. And to be free from those is true liberation and true, uh, true eternal life. Yes? I've always thought that the, the incarnation, God becoming us, made us in Christianity unique from other religions, that they don't have that. Yeah. Could you tie that into somehow? Yeah, I think um, we talked about how Islam has... Their faith is believing in a book. Our faith is believing in a person. That's a big difference. And I, I always cringe a little bit. If I'm going to insult some other people, just won't do it. I've only got two minutes. I, I don't like Scripture being called the Word of God. That's not really correct. What is the Word? What is the Word of God? It's Jesus. The Word was made flesh. That's Christian. The Word was made word is the Quran. Now, is Scripture a word from God? You bet. But the Word of Christ always reigns supreme. I'm a regular Christian. Anybody know what that means? Some of y'all do. <laughs> Jesus' words. Yeah, what's a, what's a red letter Bible? You ever had one? <laughs> That's right. And boy... If I am not sure about what scriptures tell me to do, I go to those red pages really quick. Because the way I interpret scripture is through Jesus. The Word. The Word, the very essence of God. And so I want, I think it's important that we realize what a great gift we've been given in our salvation and, and be grateful for it. My religion matters to me. And I, it upsets me sometimes how relativistic we get because we think, to be fair, we've got to treat all religions the same. Let me tell you right now, if you came to me and said, what kind of car do you want? I will tell you because I'm a believer in Toyota Corolla. I've had three of those cars, and every one of them has been just exceptionally good. Now, what is it in our culture that I can be more of an evangelical for Toyota 
than I can be for the Christian faith. And it's because I think we don't know what is unique about our faith. And that is this great gift of grace. Okay, I've got two minutes and I'm going to say another word. Y'all going to... Yes? Correct me if I'm wrong, but my Christian religion has always taught me that belief and acceptance in Jesus Christ is the only way for me to achieve salvation. You seem to have implied that good work can earn you salvation. I, I kind of read that in what you said. No, you definitely got that right. And, and my statement that I believe in Jesus Christ doesn't save me either. Jesus saves me. And so, uh, and, and honestly, this is a, a difference that you'll find in Christianity. But what I hold on to the Christian faith, that even saying, as Jesus said, everyone who says, Lord, Lord, nope. So it seems to me that we just have to say, what if, if you and I'm not trying to change your minds. I can't do that. What I'm just doing is trying to challenge you to think this through a little bit. And so I appreciate your position. A lot of Christians hold that. I don't think that works for me or for uh, a good number of, of uh, Protestants. Thank you. Anybody?